I'm excited to start a new series this morning. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time, the, the book of Exodus, an intriguing book, one that certainly sets the stage for what we know to have happened in the New Testament with, with Jesus and his redemption, his saving us, the crossing of the Red Sea kind of being an illustration of baptism and, and how, that, how that, the role that that plays in, in salvation and God saving us, a lot of metaphors that we'll be drawing from this book. It's also the book that the folks who are doing Lads to Leaders, raise your hand if you've got a Lads to Leaders young person in your house that's studying Exodus. Several of you do, and uh, you guys are, they're, they're going to be taking that to Lads to Leaders, and, and uh, they're going to be uh, having some questions on that for their Bible Bowl. And so we'll look forward to studying that along with them and uh, maybe uh, having them quiz us on it. So be familiar with it. You may have to answer some, some tough questions. So one of the themes of Exodus, one of the things that we'll look at through the book of Exodus is this idea of a new identity, of a new identity in God that the, the, the family of Israel, the family of Jacob, takes on through their experience in Egypt and through the, the Exodus and in, and, in their, and in their wilderness wanderings that are chronicled here in the book of Exodus. And we're going to be looking at that. I encourage you to read it uh, several times through if you can. Uh, to, to get an idea of what we're talking about. Unfortunately, as we preach these lessons, I have to, have to pare it down into small little packages, and so I think you get a better feel for what we're talking about if you're reading it as we're, as we're preaching it and as we're going through that. So I encourage you certainly to do that. Speaking of this idea of identity, it kind of took me back to my younger days, days when uh, uh, everybody... And it seemed like on the road had an, a little antenna, about a four or five foot antenna on their car. That meant in their car, they had a radio that had a little speaker on or microphone on it. And it was called a, a CB or Citizens Band Radio. How many of you had one of those or remember having those in the car? All right. Now, now let me ask you this. What was your handle? You know what I'm talking about? What was your handle? You remember what that was? I'd be interested, honestly, in knowing several, for, for several of you what your, what your handle was. Roy, do you remember yours? You know what? I, I suspect he may need to come forward on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would honestly, it, it's embarrassing for me to share mine too, but I'm going to. Because um, when you came up with a handle, you kind of had to think in terms of, of what was what described you? What were you? What were you about? It was a, it was a, a term or a, a phrase you would use to refer to you. This is, and you would give your handle, your name, and people would would uh, could ask for you as you if you drove during the same times. A lot of times it was used during a commute to work or something along those lines. My dad, he drove an hour, nearly an hour one way to get to work every morning, and then another hour back. And so they would, they would use it to find out where the state highway patrolmen were, right, as they're going back and forth to work. What were they called at that point in time? Smokies or bears, yes. The, the, that, was a, that was another term that was used for them. Where are they? Where's the, where are they set up so I can avoid my, the speeding tickets and, uh, and that kind of a thing? There were other, other uses, some, you know, entertainment purposes. People would talk on there and some, I'm sure, uh, not so good. When you came up with a handle, you kind of had to think, okay, what describes me? What am I about? And I was young, all right? So please remember that as I, as I tell you this. I was young. And, uh, I, you know, probably, so this is, I, what, se 75 to 85, I'm guessing? Is that kind of when CBs were, were going on and when they were, when they were pretty popular? Um, Tracy, did you have one? Did you, did you, do you have a handle? I, you're not telling the truth either. I know you're... <laughs> It's making people lie here, I tell you. <laughs> the, uh, you had to kind of think in terms of who am I and, and what am I, what am I about? I was probably, I don't know, 15 at that point in time. And, uh, and so I came up, I, trying to think of what it was. My dad's handle was Drano. And it made sense for him. He was, he, his name is Dean. And they, at work, they called him Dino. And that kind of got, got, altered through time to, they called him Drano. So that was kind of his, his nickname at work, and so he kind of went with that. 
So that was his work ID, work identification. He, he, he chose his handle based on that. I'm thinking, what, what do, how do I describe myself? What's something, and maybe something that you really like, right? Um, something that, that people might know you for. And so I thought of all that and, and what I came up with, I'm really kind of embarrassed about. But if you'd asked for me on, on the CB radio back in that time, I was the taco kid. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's one of those things I would do differently if I could go back. Um, not, not ha- but hey, <laughs> they said, what are you about? I was about tacos at that point. <laughs> I, when mom served those, I, I, was, I was all about those. That was, that was great. And you still see, tacos are pretty popular, right? They're, they're really good. I would have gone with something cooler if I could do that now. Um, but that's what it was back then. And so when people ask for me, that's, uh, that's the name I would, I would give them. And, and uh, as I talked on the radio, I'm sure they thought that I had Hispanic roots. But it was, uh, it, that's, that's what it was about. What would it be for you if you had to do that right now? If you had a handle, something people would know you by in some, I don't know, some medium, somehow. What are you about? What's something you really like? What do they think, of, what do they think about you? What comes to mind when they, when they see you? You know, for some of you, it might have something to do with fishing or hunting or cars or motorcycles or place you played in the military or part you played in the military, something along those lines. Others may have more, to, others that may have more to do with food, with interests that you take on. But what are you really? If you had to sit down and come up with a four or five words that described you and who you are. You know, I, I, I've done this before and I'm guessing maybe some of you have too. I've done this before. It's not an easy list to come up with. You have to really kind of think deep and think hard. What are the things that are you? Not necessarily the things that other people perceive are you, but what are the things that are you, that are uniquely you, that make Mike Mike and Tom Tom, Josh Josh? What makes, what makes that up? What do you think makes that up? And come up with that list. Think about, as you're thinking about you and who you are and what your identity is, I want us to take us back in time to the Israelites, the the nation of Israel, the Hebrews, that were in Egypt during the time of Moses and the Exodus. Who were they and what were they about? Anyone who's read this first chapter of of Exodus, you you realize and you understand that that to start out Exodus, you have to really start out with Joseph. Joseph provides the backstory for Exodus and, and what's going on there. And the last several chapters of the book of Genesis detail the life of Joseph, or at least that part of the life that Moses wants to familiarize us with as he moves forward into Exodus. Joseph is born in Genesis chapter 30, but then there are a number of chapters that go by before it talks, it talks again about his dreams about his relationship, his strained relationship with his brothers and with the, the members of his family. And with how his brothers decided to resolve that strain in their relationship, one time when they had the opportunity to have him away from their father and they were arguing amongst each other as to whether they should kill him or just do something else, let him live. That was where that strain was. Joseph wasn't liked by them. And at some point in time, they because of some of the wisdom of the older brother Reuben, they said, let's just put him in this cistern or this dry well, and we'll leave him there until we can figure out what to do with him. While Reuben was away, uh, a band of of Ishmaelites or Midianites uh, came by. They were taking goods to sell in Egypt, and the brother said, hey, we have something that you might find of value. They took their brother Joseph up out of the well, handed handed him over to them, and they immediately put his hand in shackles and was led away to Egypt. And we know the the story of Joseph in in Egypt. If you've gone through Bible classes, you remember that he first is in Potiphar's house. Potiphar was an official of of the Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt. He was a captain of the guard there. 
And his house was entrusted to Joseph. Joseph made such a good name for himself there among the household servants that he quickly became in charge of the house of Potiphar. And Potiphar left his entire household uh, under, the, under the care and the charge of, of Joseph because Joseph was a man of integrity, did what he said he would do, followed the rules, kept his master's wishes, and he did what he was supposed to do. But still, he was a slave. At some point in time, uh, Pharaoh's or, or Potiphar's wife takes a liking to Joseph, uh, tries to entice him into immorality. Joseph refuses, and we know that she accuses him of something that, that he didn't do. And because of that, Potiphar sent Joseph to prison. In prison, Joseph, again, is a man of integrity, works hard to keep his integrity, keep his connection with who he is. And his integrity is an important part of who he is. The, the guards at the jail determine quickly that they can trust him and they put him in charge of all the things that they can at jail in, in, that, in that prison. And it was actually a prison for political prisoners where Pharaoh's prisoners were kept. In jail, as, as he's in charge of everything, he meets two men, two men who had served Pharaoh. They were his cupbearer, the one who, who would taste the cup before they handed it to Pharaoh. They, he would give him his, his drink, his wine, whatever he was. And he would taste of it, and if, if he survived, then it must be okay. That's, that was kind of the job of the cupbearer. And the baker. The baker, obviously, in charge of, of the king's food. At some point, they displeased him. I don't know if it was a bad meal or, or, or what it was, but at some point, they displeased him, and they were put in prison. Both of them had dreams. Joseph interpreted their dreams. The cupbearer would put the, hand, the cup back in the hand of the king, and he would be lifted up again. The baker, Joseph determined from his dream, would not fare so well, that he would be beheaded, and his time on earth was to come to an end. And very quickly, what Joseph predicted would happen through his interpretation of the dreams came to happen. A number of years afterwards, the cupbearer, who was still in service of the, of the Pharaoh, knew that Pharaoh had had a dream, a really important dream, one that disturbed him greatly. You remember the seven fat cows and the seven lean cows coming up out of the Nile, and the lean cows devoured the fat cows. And then the, the heads of grain, same thing happened, fat, good heads of grain, uh, are approached by the, are, are engulfed or, or, or taken in by the lean, bad look, year, or looking grain. Pharaoh wonders what that means. The cupbearer says, hey, I seem to remember in prison there's a guy that can take care of that. He can, trans, he can uh, interpret your dream and tell you what they mean. Pharaoh called Joseph. Joseph was given by God the interpretation of that dream. There would be seven years of, of famine or seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. So Joseph said, hey, store up the good, the extra grain in the years of, of plenty, and then you'll have some during that time of famine. And we know that's exactly what came to be. If we can get that next slide, please. That's exactly what came to happen. Joseph, in his predictions, was right. And in, in those years, a lot of grain was stored up so much, the Scripture tells us that they stopped counting how much. It was just so much abundance of grain that was stored up, and then those seven years came to an end, and the famine struck. And when the famine struck, Egyptians came to get grain from Pharaoh's stores, and then people from all over the region at that time came to get grain from Pharaoh's stores because he had so much extra and because the people needed to eat. They needed food. You know, the J Joseph's brothers were sent to get grain whole story on how that goes. You'll have, to, you'll have to read that. I don't have time to go into that this morning. They make a couple of visits to get grain. Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers. And his brothers were the ones that had sold him into, into captivity. He finally reveals himself and says, listen, I realize that your treachery, your deeds were actually God's plan. God planned for me to be here in Egypt, to be in my position because Pharaoh had elevated him to second in charge in Egypt. Nobody was greater in Egypt than Joseph was. And because of that, his, his brothers had to come to him. His dreams were fulfilled. He dreamed that they would bow down to him, and they made fun of him for that. That's exactly what happened. His family bowed down to him because he was a ruler in Egypt. 
They came to get grain. He revealed himself, said, I'm your brother. Everything's good. I want you to bring everybody on down. And that's what happened. That's the backstory. Jacob and his packed up his family and his things, his belongings, and they all moved to Egypt. And in Egypt, Pharaoh, who obviously was a big fan of Joseph, said, hey, I've got a place, just a place for you guys to live. It's in Goshen. Goshen is north of what we know of as Cairo, kind of north and, and east of Cairo, in the river delta, the delta where the river goes out into the, into the Mediterranean. Probably a fertile, probably pretty flat, good area for their, for their sheep. But in Genesis, I think it's interesting, we also have a, an idea of how the Egyptians felt about Hebrews and about shepherds. Because back in those days, those were pretty much synonymous for those who were around them. Hebrews were shepherds. They, were, they raised livestock for a living. That's what they did. Two places it tells us that when Joseph interacted with his brothers, one in, in, uh, in chapter 43, he's eating with his brothers, but he can't eat with them. He and the Egyptians have to eat separately from them because Scripture tells us for him to eat with his brothers was detestable to the Egyptians. And in another place, Genesis 46, verse 34 it says that Hebrews were detestable to the Egyptians. Why? We don't know exactly. The guesses are is there were some religious reasons. The Hebrews had a different God and a different religion, and they had to keep their distance from them. But also because of their occupation, because of the fact that they tended livestock. I don't know. Did they smell like the livestock? Uh, were they dirty? Were they considered to be dirty because of that? Possible. I don't know exactly. But I do know that not only did they have livestock and things with them, but Pharaoh also let, him be, let them be in charge of his livestock. And so they, not only did they have their own things, but Pharaoh allowed them to have his, some of his things, care of some of his things. And because of that, they had a good standing in Egypt, at least while Joseph was alive. In the Bible, we're told that, 70, that about 70 made the trip from where they were, paid in Aram, to where they, be, where they came to be in Goshen in Egypt, about 70 people. Those numbers differ because of who they counted and who they didn't. One place it says 66. Stephen, when he's telling the story, says 75 in the book of Acts. So that's an ish kind of statement, but around 70 made that journey and took up their livelihood there in Egypt while Joseph was in charge. If you had asked them back then, who are you? What is your status? While they were living in Goshen, while they were still kind of a family unit, Jacob or Israel was still with them. Who were they? Well, they were Jacob's family. They were a family of Abraham. They were also, maybe their greatest status was they were relatives of Joseph, number two in Egypt. Yeah, he's, he's our brother. That's kind of who they were. That's what they were. That's what gave them status. That's what gave them a place there in Egypt. And it's who they came to be known as as they lived there. But as we know, and as Genesis or Exodus chapter 1 tells us, that all changed. At some point in time, a new ruler came into power. Verse 8. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Again, because of how far back that goes, we're not exactly sure who that, who that is. Uh, some believe it was Amhos, uh, and I'm probably pronouncing that really badly, or Thutmose, both of the 18th dynasty in, uh, in Egypt. Whoever it was, though, it was, had a different mindset. If it was Amhos, and some believe it was, he also uh, kicked out the, a group called the, the Hyksos, H-Y-K-S-O-S. And apparently they were a level of leadership, e Egyptian leaders, who had Semitic or Hebrew roots. And so maybe some of the line of Joseph, maybe some people that Joseph had, had appointed uh, from his family to, to take leadership roles. He didn't, this, uh, this new king didn't want anything to do with them. And so you get the sense that not only were the Hebrews detestable to him, but they were also, and we find out, a threat. He states he's afraid that they might get attacked and, and the, 
Hebrews would join in with their enemies and then they would, he's not afraid that they would fight against them, but that they would, if you're reading along, you can see that they would leave. I mean, that says that he fears that they would leave gives you the, gives you the idea that, they, that the king, the Pharaoh, realized that the Israelites had some value. Whether they had become a part of the, the livestock structure of Egypt, their ability to deal with livestock and their ability to breed livestock added wealth in Egypt. But we get the sense that they're leaving, and this is going to be a big thing later, that their leaving was going to be very, very costly. And this Pharaoh wasn't willing to let that happen. He did two things. He takes two measures. One, he, he submits the Israelites, the Hebrews, to forced labor. They were in a building phase right then. Building cities. Some believe the, the Israelites may have had a, a hand uh, in, under forced labor conditions, but they may have had a hand in building some things that are actually still present in Egypt even now. Some of the pyramids may have been, may have been uh, the Israelites may have had a hand in those. Again, we're not sure, depending on the dating. But they were building for the Egyptians. The fact that they were forced labor says that they got no compensation for that other than just they were allowed to stay alive. They were made to work. If you haven't, uh, if you, and if you read the chapter, chapter one, the work wasn't just an, an, easy, an easy day's work. Uh, in chapter one and verse 14, it says that their lives were made bitter by harsh labor and that the, the Egyptian slave masters worked them, the, the text says, ruthlessly. They were, they were abused. They were beaten and were forced to work because of what, because of this work that Pharaoh put them to. We know that a big part of what they did was making bricks for the building of the things that they were, that they were told to build. And later on, one of their punishments is they have to make bricks without one of the essential supplies for making bricks or one of the need, one of the things that they needed. And so that was, they were required to do that. Now, it wasn't slavery necessarily as, as we tend to think of slavery. They weren't owned by individual families. Um, we get the sense that they were allowed to keep property. They were allowed to have their own possessions, their own flocks and herds and their own children and have their own places. We get the sense that while their dwellings weren't as posh as the Egyptian dwellings, they were still allowed to have their own homes and their own houses. But what they did with their flocks and their homes had to be done on their own time. Other times they were forced to labor, made to work, made to do Pharaoh's bidding. And again, chapter one tells us they were miserable. So one time, they're the brothers of Joseph. We're the family of Joseph. He's number two in the land. Gotta go, gotta go see him if you need some grain. If you wanna eat, you gotta go through Joseph. He's our man. He's our guy. Now at this point, Pharaoh says, I don't know this, Joseph. You guys are gonna work. You're gonna become slaves. Talk about from up here to down here. Now, what's their identity? Now, who are they? If you ask an Israelite at that point in time, when they're forced to labor, if you were to ask them who they were, what's their answer? We don't know all the answer, but we know that part of it would have to include the fact that they were slaves, that they had no status other than being forced to work. The other measure that Pharaoh took against the Israelites to, to calm his mind about the threat that they posed was to try to reduce their, their numbers. And so he asked the, the midwives, those who helped in the delivering of the children, that if a boy was born, that they should put him to death. And if a girl was born, they should let her live. Different times, but man, even for those times, that's horrid. That's awful to think of just routinely killing babies because of their gender. They would throw them into the Nile. The Nile was considered a, a god by the Egyptians. And so they were sacrificing their babies to the Egyptian gods. Well, the Bible says that the, the midwives weren't, weren't all that in, in, in favor of what Pharaoh wanted them to do. They may have indicated that they would do it or they took the command, 
but we get the sense that they didn't do it. They later, they're asked, why are the boys living? Why aren't you killing the children? And they said, well, the Hebrew women have the babies before we can even get there. And so they had an excuse. But the fact is, they were just letting them live. You know, one might look back, especially someone who is perhaps skeptical, and see this family that God had determined to bless. In fact, interestingly enough, in Genesis chapter 15, when God made his covenant with Abraham, you remember the scene, just a a very compelling scene. Abraham and God were having this conversation about covenant, and God had told Abraham to to cut a cow and a goat and a bird and, and to cut them and to kill them and cut them in half. And lay both halves on either side of a of a hill so that their blood trickled into the the valley that 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 those hills made. And it was a tradition at the time that that someone wanting to make a very serious vow would would do that, and then they would walk through the stream of blood that was made, and they would intentionally wear garments that would dangle into that blood, so that the garment would be stained permanently with the promise with the covenant that they were making and so God says I'll make a covenant with you and he sets up the scene with the animals with the blood and it's getting it's getting laid and and he sees a torch and a fire pot kind of and you get the sense that they're kind of floating in the air and they pass through this valley and it's God saying I promise everything I say will come to pass but even at that time God's telling them, your people will become a great nation. They'll be numerous as the sand of the shore. You won't be able to count them. Just a huge nation that I'm going to make of you, and they're going to be a great nation, and they're going to be my nation, my people. But, God says, they're going to have to go through a time of captivity. God tells them right then, 400 years, they're going to be slaves in another land. And then, as you play it forward, his great-grandson Jacob has this son Joseph that takes them into Egypt. And in Egypt, they are indeed made slaves. They're slaves for about, they're, they're in Egypt for about 430 years. Slaves for roughly half of that, if I, if, if I do the math right, if I look at it right, if the commentaries look at it right. And in that time, again, as they're slaves, some might say, Where is God in this? God's made this promise to them. They're supposed to be a great people. Why in the world would he subject them or allow them to be subjected to this kind of slavery? Number one, God doesn't cause those things, but sometimes he allows them. I think in all of our lives, obviously we probably have never had to go through a a time uh, in our lives personally where we've had the status of a slave, but we've all had times, we've all had seasons of darkness, and there'll be more. We've all had times when we've looked out and wondered, does God not see my suffering? Does God not realize where I am and what's going on around me? Where could God possibly be in my time of suffering? Let's go to that last slide, please. And in Exodus chapter 1, you might ask that question about the Israelites. Where was God? And Moses tells us here that when the midwives refused to keep Pharaoh's bidding, when the midwives didn't do what he, what, what he told them to do, Moses tells us in the book of Exodus, so God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Where was God amidst the Israelite suffering? Well, he was right there. He was with them. He saw what they were going through. He loved them. He cared for them. And even while they were going through a time of struggling, he continued to bless them. Later, we see that no matter what Pharaoh did, it didn't matter. The Israelites continued to grow as a nation and as a people. But still, think about being an Israelite at that point in time. You're under the 
under the thumb, under the control of the most powerful man in the world. At that time, very little doubt that, that the Egyptians were the most powerful people in the day. They had the most military technology. They were better trained, more weapons, more technology in terms of building and things than anybody else. And Pharaoh showed that he needed them, the Israelites, and he showed that there was no chance that he was gonna, that that was ever gonna change. For them, that situation had to look pretty bleak. They were, nothing was ever gonna change. Nothing was ever gonna be different. It would take a miracle to save them. And none of them knew that a miracle was exactly what was coming. When we're in our time of darkness, in those times in our lives, where we look up and wonder, where is God? I hope we can remember this part of Exodus. As the people are looking at themselves and their situation and saying, we don't have a chance. This is the way it always is. And make note of the fact that there were Israelites who were born and died Generations of Israelites who were born and died knowing nothing but forced labor. They were slaves that entire time. Seems hopeless. How can they be saved from that? Where is their salvation going to come from? No one in the world can face Egypt. No one can rescue them. So how in the world are they going to be saved? Well, we know how the story ended. We know because we've sat in Bible class and and talked about the Red Sea and we've seen Charlton Heston with, you know, let my people go. We know how that ends, but they didn't. Look at them in this place. They had no idea how salvation, how any change in their circumstance was ever gonna happen. No hope. Where's God? He's there. He has a plan. He's working his plan. And at some point in time, they'll see his salvation. We'll bring that to us, right? In our dark days, in our dark times, the things that we worry about now, the things that we're concerned about now, it be a financial situation, a family situation, sickness, temptation, addictions, whatever that is, whatever makes your dark times know it's part of a plan. When you ask where God is, the saint answers the same. He's right there. He sees your suffering. He knows what you're going through. He loves you, and he cares about you. He may be using your circumstances for a future thing, for a future thing that he's doing. And if, that, if that's the case, praise him for that. He may be saying like he did the Israelites at this time, hold on, something's coming. It's going to be good. Something, that's, something you're going to remember forever is on its way. You need only be still. How does that speak to your life situation? How does that speak to where you are today? As God whispers in your ear, I know you're hurting. I know your struggles. I know the darkness that's about you. Know that I'm here. Know that I care. Know that I'm working. Know that it's going to get better. Whatever your situation is this morning, I encourage you to give that up to him. To give your suffering, your darkness, your difficulties over to God. To know that he's with you in your struggles and to know that someday, somewhere, it may be for you, it may be for your descendants, for those around you, but we don't know. But someday, somewhere, the seas are gonna part The struggle is going to be crossed, traversed, and what's waiting on the other side is a time when God is going to make his presence known and is going to be with you forever. Whatever that looks like for you, we we want to hear about it. We're going to have people around the auditorium this morning and be happy to talk with you, to pray with you about whatever your darkness is. Maybe you have a, a friend or a loved one who's going through a dark time of their own and you want to pray with them or for them. We want to be here for that. Find one of the the guys that will be standing around the room here. Get with them and pray with them. 
The content of your prayers won't be mentioned in front of the congregation unless you specifically ask for it to be. It'll be just between you and them. But bring your sufferings. Bring your darkness. Bring your concerns to them. And let's pray about that together. If you've not passed through the waters yet, beautiful analogy that we'll come to in a couple of weeks. If you've not gone through the water, had your time when you could go through that sea and be delivered from your captivity in sin, that's the analogy of baptism. Kind of think about our stage here. The the blue represents water, and the baptistry is how you go through your water. How you go through that time to where you're free from the captive of sin and, and go to walk with God. Your sins are washed away. You're given a new life. You're given a new name, a new identity. If you haven't done that yet this morning, we invite you to come and do that, to come and pray with us. Whatever your needs are, let us know. Zach's going to sing a song now to encourage you to do that. Let's sing.